So we have been in a series. This is, we're still forging on. This is message number 13. Um, and we're dealing with the subject of sanctification, holy and holiness, and we have been trying to unfold and understand really not the, maybe what the traditional stamp has been, but how to best understand, as I've been repeating this scripture for the last couple of weeks, using it as a launching pad, Hebrews says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And that got me thinking, well, shouldn't we understand what exactly that means? Is is the definition, should the definition of this word, as we went through the Old Testament looking at all the Hebrew words, Should this word carry the connotation of purity and uh, morality? And we've already covered that. The answer is no. We're talking about a a dimension or an attribute of God. And as we moved into the New Testament, and I looked at last week with you the, the understanding of from the Mount of Transfiguration, that word metamorphosis, to help us to understand what the Spirit of God is helping us to to do, to be, to become. Um, I think the first message I dealt with was out of John 17 in Jesus' high priestly prayer. So I'm covering a different dimension of the same subject, but now we're kind of busting open the boundaries a little bit because whereas I was laying down the meaning of the word and we did a little bit of that, today we're going to do a little bit of translation, which sometimes people get scared when I say I'm going to do something in another language and I don't understand. That's okay. That's how we get to understand. The wonderful thing about this ministry is um, the fact that your pastor has a love for anything that is ancient antiquity, the languages, any, any documents that can be supporting to this book, including some of the oldest extent manuscripts that we have in private hands. So I'm able to go and check and see, does this really say this? And where we get into a lot of problems in the church, where people say, well, I use the NIV, I use the King James, I use the BLT Bible. (laughs) Okay. Whatever you're using, you need to understand it's it's all English. doesn't matter if it's really good, flowing, like I said, the NIV, that's very readable, that translation version done in 1978, or whether you're reading the King James with me, which is from the 1600s, but it's all English. So we, we have to sometimes go back to those original languages for the New Testament. It's predominantly 100% uh, Greek, and that's what we are going to look at today. So I'm taking you into the book of Ephesians as part of our series. Um, and we're going to pick apart a verse, and we may actually, after picking apart the verse, we may look at one or two other scriptures that are supporting similar to reinforce and measure on God's repeatables. When God is saying something more than once through the mouth of any of his inspired writers, we know we can begin to make solid doctrine from those repeatables. So, Ephesians, and Lord knows we've had hundreds of messages over um, the last... 40 plus years of ministry through this ministry, we've had hundreds of messages out of Ephesians. Um, And if you're here like a long time attendee, some of the words I'm going to uh, use today will be familiar to you. And if they're not, don't worry. They're concepts that we, I introduce them, try and make them as simplified as possible. I usually will repeat when I feel like it's not clear and it will repeat on the network as well. So if you miss something anywhere, it's okay, at least for today. (laughs) All right, Ephesians, the first chapter. And um, let me start by reading verse 3, although my focus is verse 4. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places or in the heavenlies in Christ. If you see italics in your Bible, that is added by the translators for the sake of flow and ease in making the translation or the version. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And as you can see, there is a colon, which means the verse continues. And if we were looking at this from any one of those second or third century manuscripts, um, if I'm pretty sure off the top of my head, um, we might have some portion of the book of Ephesians out of the Chester Beatty Papri, which is called P46. We might... Uh, see that there is no chapter and verse. It's just a letter. So when I say, notice the colon there, the, the mindset of the, of the writer, the, of the Apostle Paul, is, is completing a thought process, not trying to punctuate. There is essentially no punctuation in the Greek. In, if we're looking at the uh, most extant or, or, or older manuscripts, save for maybe a small dot at the top of a sentence, or what we call the nomina sacras, which are the abbreviated symbols so that the writers didn't have to keep writing out Jesus Christ or Holy Spirit, those things. But in general, no chapter and verse, no punctuation. So we're looking at a whole thought process that I'm actually chopping in half by telling you to focus on the colon. So don't focus on the colon, right? (laughs) But let's take a look at this, because this verse contains some pretty fantastic Greek words. The first one, I'm going to actually write out some part of, I may actually end up writing out some or all of the verse. You'll have to forgive me, but sometimes I try to reserve my my linguistics for a time when it, it really will be helpful, and I think today it will be helpful. If you've been around any amount of time, you're going to be recognizing some of these words, and for those who are not Greek students at all, Kathos, ex, elex, eto. That's phonetic, so it's maybe off in my attempt to spell it for you, but that's how it sounds out or how it looks. Umas, in autu, and here we go. Um, pro, kataboli, and I'm going to finish the rest of this as we go, so I'm not writing all this time. I want us to first focus on this word, which in your King James is, he hath chosen us. All those words make up this one Greek word. Now, I've told you, I will reserve my use of grammar when I think it has an impact. This definitely made an impact on me the first time I heard it. I'm hoping that people that hear this for the first time, it will make an impact on you. In the Greek... You have this word here, exalexito, as a verb. It is in the aorist, which means nothing to you maybe right now, Um, indicative, but there's something really great about this word. It's in what the Greek calls the middle voice. Now, for us in the English language, the middle voice is reflexive. Reflexive is for themselves. You've got to add something to show that the individual is doing an act, for themselves. We have to add that in our language. In the Greek, you just put it in the middle voice and that tells you that the subject is doing something for themselves, completely independent of other actions and for their benefit. So when it says here, kathos, that is according, or that could be translated in a number of ways, but this exalexito is important. According as he hath chosen us in him. Well, he has chosen us for himself. That's the starting point. Now, for people who have been sitting in this ministry listening for the better part of 20 or 30 years, this is a real familiar word, this Greek word, exalexito. And why it was important for me to bring this out to a new group of people today is when you understand this verse is saying God chose, God made this election. God chose out, and let's just put it the way it is. God chose you 
out from among other people he did not choose. Now, it's a hard thing to deal with because somebody's going to read this and say, well, doesn't God want to choose everybody? And the answer is no. The answer is no. And if you say it's yes, you are completely going against what the Bible says. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Does that tell you that God loves everybody? No. Now, God's love can be accessed. It can be by faith appropriated. We can talk about God's love as the gift that's implanted in us. But you can't get God to choose you by anything that you've done. We call that the life of faith, our faith understanding, not by works, by faith. So it's interesting to me that when we tackle this, the first part of, remember, this is a series on sanctification and understanding sanctification and holiness. Why should we understand this word and include it in our study of this verse makes total sense. Why? Because read through the rest of it. Uh, With this word being rightly understood that God chose us for himself. Somebody else didn't choose me. I wasn't an accident. You're not an accident. Deliberate, specific, absolute, nothing like, well, I'm really not sure. If you're here and you're listening to me, if you're listening to somebody preach the word of God today, it's not an accident. A lot of people like to say they find you by accident, but it's not an accident. God has abundant methods, I've always said this, to get to you where the rubber meets the road. And I also believe that God will send enough opportunities. At some point, I think there are people who are the parable of the sower. They cannot hear. Remember that, the parable of the sower, there's people in there that can't receive. Correct? Are you reading the same Bible? Or am I reading the spaceship Bible and you're reading the earthly people Bible? Good. Okay. So having said that then, we have God doing the choosing. And I want to kind of go through this real slow because my bit, my besetting sin is to rush through things and come on, let's get through this. Take your time. So the object of the verb chose, this is pretty important is us. If the object of chose is us, some would like to make the object Christ and solve the problem conveniently by saying, if the object of the verb chose is Christ, then we could be chosen in Christ. God could choose us in Christ, but that's not what the verse says. So there's something important about the triune nature of God, which is chosen in him, that is, God the Father, chosen through God the Father and the agent for our faith, Christ, but not, and this is what I, it's a little bit confusing right now, I'm going to try and go back and clear it up again and again, not Christ as the object of the verb, because that would change the essential meaning of how we can apply and understand it. So that's number one. Number two is as I go through this verse, I also see something else. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. That Greek is pro kataboles cosmo. And that choosing before the foundations of the world, this is another area, again, if you can make some notes somewhere, these are like the bullet point important things to understand this verse. And if you're really wanting to do the real work, here's where the real work begins. If you look at this verse, it says, He hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We're going to deal with be holy and without blame before him and in love in several parts. But what I want to talk to you right now about is before the foundation of the world. Because this is the other place where people make a shipwreck. Now, look, I, I didn't write this, okay? So when I'm saying something and I'm explaining something, I'm saying... This is what the book says. This is not what Melissa Scott says. The fact of the matter is that at the beginning, at the genesis of how is it possible that God could speak your name before everything, but that's what the Bible says, which tells me something. You're not an accident. You're not here by accident. You're not in God's presence or desiring to understand who he is by accident. He called and he chose you. Way back there. Well, but I've only been in existence on this fine planet for 51 years. Well, 
God said way back, way, way, way back. Now, I know there's people that are saying the earth is much older than we think it is. It doesn't matter if it's this old or that much older. If it's that much older, it doesn't matter. God spoke your name and mine, and that is the reason why all of these little subtleties in this verse begin to build a foundation for understanding sanctification and holiness is a lot of people think they come into the church by accident, they start fading by accident, they're found by accident, they like to use the terminology that says, I found God. No, sir, you did not. You did not find God. That's as bad as people saying, this is my theology. It's not my theology, it's the theology of the book. It's bad enough when I hear people say, and I know it's done all the time, modern Christendom will not correct itself, the church will not correct itself, the pastors will not correct this. You do not make a decision for Christ. You will never make a decision for Christ. You know why? Because Christ chose you before you were even alive. If you get that, how kooky are we? How, really, how cavalier are we? I accept Jesus. And I accept that he's doing all this wonderful work for me. No, no, it's a gift. The fact of the matter is failure to understand how this gift is given to you creates a lot of casual appointees into the kingdom. Now, I don't, I don't mean to be insulting, but what I just said is a big mouthful. It should be like an attitude adjustment when people say, really, if you really believe that, before 51 years of me here, was here, in the eons before I ever came into being, God called my name, and I'm, I'm using me, but it's the same for anyone who's listening and hearing today, which means if you're not an accident and God planned, it also means that God will give you the free will, because you're not a wind-up toy. He'll give you the free will, just as he had the free will to choose you. Interestingly enough, the all-omnipotent one, can choose anybody, but he chose you. These are the things that make me stop and think, if we were studying a little bit more theology in the body of Christ, we'd have a really strong body because people would be sure in understanding what they're reading. I am not saying, and I will never say, do you think you're saved? Do you know you're saved? How do you know you're saved? People do that. They bring confusion. The thing is, if you come to the faith and you say, Jesus Christ is Lord, because you've read this book, and the book says, Jesus came saying, essentially, something is wrong with the whole world, and only his death can fix it. And he's going to raise up again. And when he raises up again, he will be the first of this kind, and we will follow in his steps. Then you're not an accident. And then suddenly everything becomes real and serious including what God is doing in us. So let me go back to the text where it says that we should be holy. That is our Greek word. Remember, we were looking in the Hebrew. In the Old Testament, we were looking at our kadosh, kadesh, all of those words. But when we went into the Greek, into the New Testament, the word becomes hagios. And this particular word that we should be holy in this setting, is an adjective. Now, I do these things for a reason, because I think a lot of times when I, when I say this, people say, oh, she's just showing off that she can, she can do um, morphology and she can do syntax. No, I'm telling you something. The help that you get from this is immeasurable, because an adjective is describing something. It can be describing the quality or state of something, But normally it is a descriptive. It is telling us something about usually a noun describing a helper, but it's not a verb. So again, this is where I've I've tried to navigate through all of these messages that because holy is an adjective here, it's describing something about us, but it is not saying if it was a verb, and hear me out, if it was a verb, we would be actively engaging in trying to be holy. I've already cleared this up. I've already covered this ad nauseum. It's describing something that God desires us to be, but it is descriptive. It is not action at this point. 
The same thing is true for the word without blame. And I need to describe these or explain these two words because they reappear at least three times. Let me show you here. Uh, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. That's Ephesians 1.4. Uh, Ephesians, don't turn there because I'm going to go back to 1.4. But again, you're going to read the same thing, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish, which is the same words, same Greek words appearing in Ephesians 1.4. You'll read it again in Colossians uh, Colossians 1.22, which says, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable, which is the same Greek word, even though they like to change the words in the English, it's the same Greek word. So you can see that holiness and without blame and sometimes with love, but certainly holiness and without blame or holy and without blame are being used together. And I just gave you three, but they actually occur elsewhere. This same type of use, this is what's so crazy. The same type of use, the combination of these words, used in the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, for all of the sacrifices and offerings, holy and blameless or without fault. So you, can, you definitely now are beginning to see the shift of the use of the words away from the Old Testament ceremony, ritual, offerings to something that is now pointing us in a different direction. This is why I said to you, once we separate the words, you start to see, well, it could never mean that. Now, in this particular setting, and this is extremely difficult, and I have probably read every commentary through these words to see that I have not found anybody that would actually set this verse and verses like it in order. Your, that we should be holy and without blame needs to be only understood after you circle one critical word in this verse. Actually, two. Before him. That ought to tell you that holy and blameless does not happen now. Before him, in his presence, which is why when I keep telling you about Thessalonians saying, the God of peace shall sanctify you holy, It doesn't say over there, but it is through the grammar implied. Holy over there means that this same verse where it says, before him, holy and blameless before him. If you read this verse and you omit the before him, you're going to get the people come out and say, well, you got to act this way. you got to do this thing. We're talking about before him in his presence. Now, there'll be people who will homogenize what I just said and say, well, aren't, where two or three are gathered, we're in his presence. We're not talking about that. I want to make sure we're clear because this is serious stuff to me. And the confusion that's out there is, it's kind of mind-numbing. What's even more mind-numbing is we're Christians and we're supposed to understand what this means. And I'm finding as I talk to people that there's so much confusion. I'm tired of the confusion. I want to, I want to try and at least... Whatever we can clean up and make as plain as possible, that's what we're going to do. So let's pick this apart a little bit more. We have here that we should be holy, be holy, and without blame. Holy and without blame. Let's look at those two words. I'm going to write them out for you. So we have here, hagius, that is for holy. And let's write out phonetically, hagius, and This word, it's one Greek word, we got an A to put it in reverse, and this word here looks like this, amumus, amumus, one word for blameless. But I wrote down some notes here on that word, and that word is kind of an important, um, it's an important word when rightly understood. Blameless, deserving no censure, free from fault or defect. So I'm going to ask you the question. I think it should be rhetorical at this point. Could we ever be free from fault right now? So that answers the question of what Paul is saying. 
Go back now and read when it says he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. That's all the things that come from him to us, starting with our salvation, but in the heavenlies, in Christ. And you keep reading, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Well, let's add the last part, in love. Because I said multiple components here. So one component of this, that we should be holy and without blame, as I just described that word, and then before him, and then in love. Okay, that's now I've got all the words out there. Now let's go. The first thing we can know, this wonderful process that's happening for each and every one of us, it started. It started the, the moment... The moment you started fading, John 3 tells us about being born from above, the born again part of our existence as Christians. And you build from that, recognizing that that one who called you desires not just to save you. This is these are the things that I find, so I'm putting them out there. It's not just the act of saving you, it's the act of transformation. It is the act of confirmation or confirming the image and likeness to be conformed. There it is. That's the right word. To be conformed to the image and likeness of Christ. And when we talk about this before him, this is why most people make the activity of sanctification and holiness an act of moral purity, something you do, something you put on, because the very essence of what's being said is If you will yield yourself, as Romans 6 says, if you will yield yourself to whom you yield yourself, I yield myself to the Lord, unto the Lord that I have yield, I become a tool for him, in this case a tool of righteousness, where he begins the work that begins that process, that when I stand in front of him, on the day I stand in front of him, he doesn't say, depart from me, I never knew you. Why? Because I've been here with the work going on inside of me, actively fading, not working to work to make it in, but letting God do what God is supposed to do authentically what only he can do. Because I said, if, if I have to do it for him, I don't want to do it. What's the point of being a Christian? It's all a bunch of lies. If you, if you have to do it for God, if you've got to put on the airs, if you've got to make like, and I meet a lot of people who make like, I'm sorry, but... That's an insult to my Lord and Savior that died on a cross to save somebody in the world if just one person answered. The way we approach God is so backwards. He's saying he wants to do the work. He wants to do the changing. He wants to, we were talking about the clogged drains. How many of you remember I drew a picture downtown one time on the board and I, Drano, spiritual Drano, you remember that? And you probably all thought, wow, she's, she's in that job, right? But that's exactly what it is. It's clogged. We are the quintessential clogged pipes that have really never been, our whole life, however long you've existed, gunked up. God can barely move through us. And the, here comes a spiritual drain, and it may not be one act. Usually it's ongoing. Why? Because we keep getting gunked up again. This does not sound good. I don't know where to go with this one, but all I'm saying to you is this verse tells me something of what God is doing even when we don't think he's doing. It tells me something about when I start putting my way in his way. I start trying to make things happen that he's already promised he'll do. Something is not right here. Now, the reason why this this verse, the verse that I read to you, they they have specific applications. So verse 4 has to do with us uniquely standing before him, being holy, and essentially, as I said, deserving no censure, free from fault or free from the punishment. We, We have a Greek word for that too, katakrima which is ultimate condemnation or ultimate punishment, which is why Romans 8 says, there is therefore now no ultimate condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no ultimate punishment. Why? Because 
Christ got you covered. You're covered in the blood. So why verse 4 is about us at a future time, you follow through what Paul writes in Ephesians 5 and verse um, 27, I believe it was in. And here Paul is speaking about the church, that he might present it to himself. You notice that again. The church is not being pres- being presented to the church for the church. This is why I said, if we have an attitude adjustment as the church needs one desperately, and we start getting our mind fixed right on where the focus is, we're going to stop a lot of the antics. We're going to cease to be uh, an impotent band of believers, and we're going to become what God intended us to be, which is a band of people who, like those early disciples, they went out and preached. They were bold. They were fearless. They didn't worry about being politically correct. They weren't worried about if their master was hated or if they were. They went out, and for Christ's sake, they preached without fear. Man, I'm waiting for the day that there'll be somebody knock on my door here that has that mindset because I've, I've, still, I've still seen too many people in ministry who are scared. They don't want to be blunt. They don't want to just say things. I'm not saying be mean, but I'm saying put it out there in plain terms where, where people can actually say, I got it. No niceties. I didn't have to put a lot of polish on there for you. I didn't have to put a lot of sugar for you to take that down. It is the way it is. Now, once we get the real facts, we can start doing something. It's called faithing. And really faithing on, on something real solid, not on some wishy-washy theology that somebody threw out there 30 years ago and said, this is what you ought to believe. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I know. I just, I just can't help myself. Verse 27 is about the church. So it says, but that it should be holy or without blemish. So you see, Ephesians 1.4 is about the individual at a future time in his presence. Verse 27 has to do with the church. And we tend to think about the church in the here and now, but we've got the beautiful picture of the church in the book of Revelation with the 24 elders and the thrones and all the spiritual beings, there's the church right there. And the church that will come again to earth, if you're talking about a future time in the uh, future. But this is referencing the church. And if you turn to Colossians 1.22, that reference there, very similar. If you start off by reading about verse 20, having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth, things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he hath reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to what? To present you holy and unblameable, the same word, without deserving punishment, if you will, without censure, free from fault. And where it says unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. What is the condition of that that we just read? It's in the next verse. The condition is if ye continue in the faith. There's your only condition. If ye continue in the faith. Not if you work to put on your best holiness clothes. Not if you work to work at working to work. If you remain, if you stay, if you're rooted and grounded in him, in the faith. God says, I'm going to take care of the rest. Why? Why can't we just go back to the book and be happy when God says, Seek ye the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all the other things that you need. They'll be added to you. We come in and we want the additions first. Right? We have it all backwards. I want, I want this to be so clear in our minds. We come into the church, the thing I desire, the focus, the foremost thing, is that in all things Christ might have preeminence. If Christ doesn't have preeminence, in, especially in the church, but in all things, why are we here? Well, it's in that mindset that God says, I will begin to do a work in my servant. Put your name there. 
And that, that work, by the way, that he's doing, it's a pretty awesome work. Because it doesn't, it doesn't, I've said this before, I think I've said this every single week, it does not make me less. It makes me more. The changes, the transformation, the things that I'm being changed into, he takes the dross of my being. And as, as the one who wields the fire, who wields the power, he begins the work to, I coined the phrase, to de-drossify, to take out the garbage. It's lifelong. Now, who would, I'm going to ask you something. Who wouldn't want that done to them by God? Okay. Nobody raised their hand. You might have thought I was asking a rhetorical question. But who wouldn't want that done to them by God instead of you trying to do it yourself? And what you do is God's looking down going, what is that? <laughs> that doesn't look like anything that I talked about in my book that looks like somebody doing what they think I said. You know, I have people like that that work for me. So maybe I'm a little God like that way, but I get it. If, if we are letting God do the thing that he, only he can do, the transformation will come. And the transformation that comes is lifelong. I chose this verse out of Ephesians because it taps into, if you're reading the first chapter of Ephesians, it taps into the concept, the theological concept of election. And election brings up the mind, this very deep theological stuff. So sorry if you're sitting there going, oh, oh. but election brings privilege. Now, we don't walk around and say we're privileged people, but the election, the concept and the understanding brings the understanding that it's a privilege that God called you out of others that he did not call. And that doesn't mean that the people that he didn't call, that he hates them or he doesn't love them. He just chose you. God so loved the world. When, we, when, I've, when I've quoted that, I've said, don't say God so loved the world. You put your name in there. God so loved Melissa Scott. He gave his only begotten son. And that only begotten son, through him, I am saved. Through him, I have life eternal. Through him, I'm being transformed through the agency. I first came because God did the drawing. The son called to me, and the spirit is doing the work. And that work is not a work where I decide how to reinterpret God's design for my life or for your life. So this whole series of messages is kind of bringing me to a place to say, are we, are we clear at least to this point, 13 messages in? We do not do this. It's not an act. Every place I've shown you where there's a verb, it's passive, God is acting on us. Everywhere I've showed you where God is doing some activity, he's doing it for himself. It means no motivation for somebody else. It's just God doing for God because that's God's good pleasure and will to do. And probably ultimately the greatest thing that I could say out of this Ephesians letter is that God wasn't looking at, say, an Apostle Paul while he was Saul, tribe of Benjamin, Pharisee, uh, great mind, great scholar. He wasn't looking and saying, you know, I, I chose you because you had a good mind and I chose you because, you know, you have the right clothes and I chose you because you can speak and I chose you because whatever God says, I just chose you. Quit trying to qualify why and just rejoice in the fact that he did and that he did means that he's doing something in you that while all these other people may talk about what God is doing for them and how much God is blessing them and how much more, I'm telling you, God may never do another thing for me in my life because what he's already done for me is amazing in coming to save me, finding me, coming to save me, bending down, I know, before the foundations of the world, calling my name unbelievable. But then he says, but wait, it's like an infomercial. There's more because I'm not just going to leave you in the state that I saved you in and found you in, because that state is kind of crummy. Even though you, I'm looking at you through the spectacles of Christ, and I see you through the shed blood of Christ, but it's not enough, because what's inside you needs to change. And if I said to you, as if I was speaking, as if I was God, and I was telling the children of Israel, now you all got to change, their change would be their way. Their change would be, yeah, we want change, Come on, let's build a golden calf. Let's, you know, whatever, whatever their ideas were, they're all bad. God says, 
this is the way I'm going to do it. Now, I don't know who would want to reject that. I don't, this, this concept I just explained today, which is part of the series, ties into stewardship. It ties into the attitude. It ties into everything. This is where you and I could sit down and probably not say a word. We'd probably just stare at each other like, you know, one of those suspense movies. We'd just stare at each other. Because the question really that to be pondered, to be reflected upon, to be meditated upon, is if God chose you, and he chose you among people that he didn't choose, and you have free will, so you can still mess up, but he chose you. And God says, and I'm also going to change you, and I'm going to begin to transform you, and I'm going to give you the, the, the more abundant life that you were designed to have that you, because you were born in Adam, don't. My question is, now I begin to think, if I desire that God already said he's going to do this, but if I desire that God would begin to change me from the inside because I don't want to do it myself, and God's beginning to do the change, the way I see and understand the word is going to change. Do you agree with that? Because I do. I agree with what I just said. Isn't that amazing? Your, your mindset towards the word's going to change. Your mindset towards the things of God is going to change. So I'm saying for the benefit of somebody out there listening right now, this is not a random, you know, calling somebody out out there because there's, you know, there's people out there, nobody knows who it is, and I can say, oh, that person out there, but I'm saying there's somebody out there because there is somebody out there listening who may be saying, finally, I feel like I'm in a place where nobody's going to tell me I have to do this. You've got to dress that way. You've got to look that way. You've got to talk for you to be a Christian. You've got to do this, 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 this. That's all we do, right? That's all we do. I don't want that. I don't know who would want that. I'm desiring, as I've said to you, if God's not doing it, I'm not going to do it for God, but if God's doing it, look out. You are going to be changed. And look out. It's going to be a great change. And look out because it's not going to be like anything you could ever do on your own. So when we talk about holiness and sanctification, we're not talking about little ladies with buns on their heads that, you know, they haven't smiled at anybody for a year and that makes them pure and holy. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the activity that God does and when he does it. He's not doing it, by the way, because you did something special or you deserve it. It's because it's his word and he declared it and God is not a man to lie. So taking all of this together, hopefully we can transition now from what, where we've been in the messages we've been to, I think today even, we're making an application. And beginning to make those applications is where I take the words on the page and I begin to meditate, think, and figure out how they apply. Now, I, I realize now from what I've just explained that there's nothing on this subject for me to do except trust God. There's nothing on this subject for me to do except what Colossians says, if ye continue in the faith. Not if you continue trying, not if you continue working, not if you continue whatever, if you continue in the faith. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say to you what my advice is for me. I'm going to keep continuing in the faith. I'm going to keep keeping on in the faith. I'm going to keep taking God at his word because tell you what, I have seen God changed people. I know that's subjective, because how do you know, or how, how, does, how does a person understand? But I have seen God change. We're not talking about the changes that are so, oh my goodness, uh, you know, when I, when I was going and working in, in the prisons, in the jails. Well, you can probably see a lot of, wow, that's amazing. Here's a person who was a mass murderer, and now they love Jesus. That's That's amazing. But you know what? It's not that amazing when I think about it because that's what God does. But what's really amazing to me is everyday people who don't have that testimony. Everyday people who, who this, is, this is where it just is like, wow. Everyday people who do not have that radical, but God has still changed them in some capacity. And you can look and say, that may be a greater miracle. Sorry, I don't mean to abase 
somebody's change of life. That may be a greater miracle. I've told you the greatest miracle of all is when a Pharisee gets saved. <laughs> That's a great, great miracle of salvation right there. But I think the idea is each and every one of us has been touched by God, if you really think about it, in a radical way. We only compare, we compare to say, well, that person had a great experience because they were there and now they're here, but you know, we all have. Because the fact of the matter is you were either hell-bound and you are not now, or you had no faith and now you've turned your faith to God. Those are the great miracles. And along with those come the wonder of God's intent to not just save us, so don't make this one-dimensional, but to change us. And I think from all the different scriptures that I've quoted, I think the, the thing that resonates with me is it's time for the church, for the people of God, to stop playing church, to stop acting like because you put your butt in the seat, you're saved. It's time for people to start thinking. No, I'm not telling you to dress or act or do. It's time to start thinking about the mindset that says, you know, it really is true. We spend much more time focusing on these incredible testimonies of great things accomplished, but those miracles of a lesser kind happen every day and multiple times a day when somebody says, I don't know, I just wasn't interested, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm listening and I'm pretty gripped by this. That's a pretty big miracle. Maybe that person wasn't a mass murderer. Maybe they never committed a crime in their life. It doesn't matter. They're still a sinner being saved by grace. That's what we all are. And God says, I'm going to take that mess like the potter's house and I'm going to do something with it. You are not left to try and fix it or use your own devices to do it. God says, I'll take care of it for you. The question is, do you trust him to do it? I do. And, and when I say this, I think that probably it's rhetorical. That's why every, every person in the sound of my voice is probably saying, me too. So why is the church so hung up on making this, and we have terms, the deeper experience, the crisis, the second crisis, the second definite work, the sef- second definite work of grace, the second definite work of grace crisis? Why don't we just say it's God's work And God is doing the thing that he does perfectly. He works with flawed, broken, messed up. I just described me and I just described you. But when he starts the work, watch out. And the difference between those people who like to talk about how they have put on the, 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 the garb of holiness versus what God is doing. Describing a state of being, as I just looked at from Ephesians, or describing as an adjective helping us to understand something about the individual. Well, let me tell you something. When, when you or I are standing in God's presence, which means it's not happening here, but when we, and we shall stand in his presence, we shall all stand. The Bible says and give account. And some people say, well, I don't, I don't think I'm going to see God. I, I talked to the priest. Good luck. <laughs> the bus line forms over there. We're all going to stand in his presence. So figure out real quickly. You can stand in his presence having been in the boot camp for eternity down here, learning about him. So in his presence, you are indeed that. A description of you, holy, without blame, and in love. And let's talk about that last part because it's the exclamation mark. A lot of people think when you get to heaven, there's not... I just said in his presence, right? In his presence, holy, blameless, blameless, in his presence, in love. A lot of people think when you get to heaven, you won't have to deal with that. What? Love. Of course you will. But there's only going to be one kind of love in heaven. Oh, she never talked about this before. There'll only be one kind. Sorry, this is going to probably upset a lot of people out there, but there, there isn't going to be any phileo love in heaven. You know that, Right? There's not going to be any Eros love in heaven. You know that, right? Oh, boy. I'm, I hope so. (laughs) 
but in love, the, the Greek, our Greek word that we've referenced many times before, that is the agape word. Why is that so important? Because you're going to find as you study along the concepts of holiness, the change, the inner change that is happening, the work that God is doing. Galatians talks about it. That is fruit that comes from God and the fruit that will be yielded to God. There is no fruit being amassed here for you or for me. It's all for him. It will be in his presence. That in love, that agape, is part of the fruit in his presence. So when we talk about this, it turns out to be a happy, joyous in his presence, not a, uh, uh, you know, this is terrible, it's very sad. No, it's very happy. And in his presence, in love, in that uncalculated, no strings attached, and that makes perfect sense because that's all there could be in heaven. There cannot be any other type of love in heaven. And I'm saying that based on what this text should now resonate for all of us, which is something that says, you know what, maybe as Paul talked about when we were aliens, when we were enemies, when we were not reconciled, but we have been now. Something is changing. We talk about the disciples and their cataclysmic change when Christ called them to service. I do not believe for a second that any of the ones that he called said, well, I, I got to, what would Jesus do? I got to do like Jesus now. They went out and they were. They, they acted in the moment they were. They didn't try to emulate. They didn't do, you know, well, Jesus said, follow me. So we'll, we'll walk exactly the way he walks. We'll wear the same clothes because we're, we're with him, Right. I know, I'm being silly, but it's all silly to make a point. God says, I got this covered, and I'm only asking one, one thing of you for all the things that I'm talking about. Trust me. God, don't, I'm not talking about me. Trust me. I'm going to take you all the way. It's going to be for one, one element, one dimension only, your faith. All of this happens because you trusted me, you faithed in me, you... you some people may not ever get this book. They might just hear the message preached. Other people may never hear the message preached, and all they hear or read is from the book. But somehow in this book, it is declared, it is made plain for us that we're not left to our own devices. Saved, yes, and changed. The process of being changed, sanctification, that brings apart that wonderful understanding when it says new creature in Christ, all the changes that God says. So he's saying, don't, don't invent it. Just keep leaning on me. Keep trusting me. I'll take you home. And I'm going to take you home. And as I quoted First Thessalonians, the Thessalonian letter that talks about being wholly sanctified over there, I'm going to finish the job. I'm not going to leave you just slightly undone. When you come into my presence, it's going to be just like Jesus. It is finished, except it's no longer the death, the pain, the dying. It's the first day in my presence of living in the actuality of what you've basic, basically uh, strive your whole life for down here to learn. I'm, I'm going to speak as if God was speaking, to learn about me so that you can spend all eternity with me. Who doesn't want to do that? I don't know, but I want to, so I'm going to keep talking about it, and maybe enough people will say, I want to know about that too, and they'll keep learning with me, and we'll keep growing and keep understanding until one point, we're all standing in his presence over there. By the way, there's a limited room. Just joking. Uh, <laughs> but we're all standing in his presence together. And the Lord says, well done, good and faithful servant. So pretty plain. that God desires a lot for us. Pretty sad that we don't necessarily understand or appropriate, but hopefully we're making steps to do that today. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.